Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Jay Disky, Executive Director of the Pre-K-12 Learning Group, which I'm learning to roll quickly off my tongue. Uh, but thank you all for being here this evening. I'm very happy to celebrate the growth of our new division. I admit that there's a huge wow factor for me. Uh, this is something that, uh, as Tom Allen knows, <clears throat> many of you in the room know, I think this is something that uh, Candidly, that I started to think about, and Charlie McGainer and AEP began to think about, and various members of the two respective boards began to think about in 2007 8. And it was a long time in coming, and there was a long dating and courtship, and here we are all together, a single industry, a bigger voice, representing all, doing good things for everyone. So thank you so much. For being here. When we embarked on the merger of the AEP School Division and the Association of Educational Publishers, our goal was to keep and enhance the programs and services that AEP provided. Frankly, AEP was envious of the programs that AEP had. We did a lot of great things in the School Division, but they were not in the areas that AEP did in terms of awards, professional development programs. And when we began to uh, knit this merger together, we talked about the importance of the awards program, and the value of the CEO roundtable, and the conference, and the Hall of Fame awards. The Hall of Fame awards were clearly everybody's favorite, this thing, right now, tonight. And the reason why, not because it's held in fancy places, and maybe this was the fanciest, uh, but the Hall of Fame awards remind us of who we are, why we're here, how important our work is, who we serve, the good things we do for America's teachers and students. It's all about our collective commitment to American education. Now, the Hall of Fame awards have evolved in the Lamplighter Awards, <coughs> excuse me, honor scale. Of it. We realize, uh, even though we give the Hall of Fame awards to many individuals, as they move to the end of their careers, there's very good reasons to recognize people at the mid-career. And so, in order to do that, we have created what is called the Visionary Award, which recognizes individuals in the middle of their careers for their exceptional insight and leadership. During the selection process, no candidate received more praise or recommendations than Peter Reynolds. It is fitting that someone who emphasizes making the mark on the world is our inaugural Visionary Award winner. I'd like to invite his brother, Paul Reynolds, co-founder and CEO of Fable Vision, to come to the podium. So this is pretty cool. <laughs> You've got a double whammy here, right? Um, I, I consider this such an honor to be able to give this award to my twin brother, Peter. But one thing before I jump in, I just noticed that we're, um, we're sitting in a room surrounded by mirrors, <laughs> right? And what I would love for you to do is just take a look in the mirror, right? Here's a vision of a group of people who understand what the power you have to transform lives. With media, storytelling, and technology, all of you know it. Every one of you has had a chance to use those gifts to transform lives. And that's what tonight is about. So Peter might be getting this award, but really this award is for everybody in this room who walks through walls on a regular basis um, with shifting standards and crazy technology demands um, to, to really remember Tonight is about all the kids, the next generation, that we're taking care of. And one, one note to Dick Robinson, I was thinking today, earlier, that uh, I actually had a Scholastic Book Club experience very early in my career. In third grade, I got a book. I can't even remember the name of the book. But it was a book about a man who was traveling on a journey through a snowstorm, and he could see the cottage in the distance. And it took him a while to get close to the cottage. And finally, of course, what happens? The snow starts looking very comfortable. And he thinks, maybe if I just laid down and rested for a while. And you know at that point in the book, the way it was written, you can not lay down. And he has this mental struggle. And to this day, I, I keep that with me as CEO of Fable Vision. 
I must keep going. I must keep going. I cannot rest until I get to the destination. Isn't that interesting? That the power of story. And Dick, that, that's a gift that you gave to me in third grade. So you talked about... Well, thank you. <laughs> And that's, so that, that truly is, when we, we talk about the power of storytelling technology and media, we, we really mean it because we've lived it and have been touched by really amazing people who know how to raise that torch. One of the other people that I've collaborated a lot with through the years um, is a person who I pretty much have started my life with uh, when the cell split. And that's uh, Peter, Peter Reynolds. And for those of you who know us, there are two of us. Um, I do all of Peter's dangerous stunt um, <laughs> stunts in all of his movies. Um, we started our first newspaper in second grade. Um, my dad used to come up the driveway, and we would we would give him his take his shoes off and give him the slippers, and we'd take the briefcase. And we'd pop open that 1960s briefcase, and the one newspaper we gave him in the morning had turned into 15 with the magic of a seven photocopier. And it was the, not just the, the joy of creation, but it was the, share, the joy of sharing the, uh, the multiple copies. So we had publishing in our blood very early on. So fast forward um, through years of developing two separate companies, we started, uh, I was taking care of the grown-ups with media storytelling technology, and Peter did the same thing at Tom Snyder Productions with the amazing Rick Abrams. Um, and eventually, we uh, decided to bring the two entities together, and we, we, we launched Fable Vision 17, 17 years ago. Um, and I was just thinking, as I, I shift and give Peter, I think I'm actually giving Peter the award. Is that true, Stacey? Yeah, oh my gosh. But, um, the question is, why visionary, right? And why, why, why Peter? And I, I love my brother dearly and deeply. And I, I do watch him on a regular basis. Um, and he is really on a mission that inspires me because the vision piece of this, and I think every person in this room shares it, that we actually see the potential in every learner. And we know that there have to be more creative ways to reach each one of them. And Peter, every single day, exemplifies that with his stories, and he's touched my life. And tonight, it gives me great privilege and honor to help honor Peter H. Reynolds. Um, thank you, Paul. <laughs> um, by the way, Paul is my big brother by 14 minutes. Anybody here a twin? Do we have any twins here? When I, when I asked that question in kindergarten, most of the kids raised their hand. Um, we actually highly recommend being twins. Um, it's pretty cool to be born with your best friend. And, um, you know, the, the journey's tough. It's tough. I don't know how you singletons do it. <laughs> I really don't. So, I mean, kudos to you for doing it on your own. But, um, you know, we always say that if you don't have a twin, find a twin. Right? So your twin might be your business partner. It could be your wife, your husband, your partner, um, your best friend. And it's the person who keeps cheering you on, but also someone who can kind of pull you back, you know, when, you, when you're drifting a little too far into left field. Um, I know a lot about left field. I'm, I'm, uh, I am what I call the gentle rebel. And uh, I think it's kind of a theme for what's about to happen in this industry, because the rules are changing. You're probably noticing, right? The rules are changing. The way, the world we knew is really changing, and it's changing so fast, it boggles. It boggles my mind. And where the answers are going to come from are going to come from some very unexpected places. It might actually come from the kid who is not doing so well in school, right? The daydreamer. 
the doodler, the comic, the troublemaker. Those kids are not the problem, right? They are the answer to a lot of really complicated problems. And we have to get enlightened and figure out how do we, how do we invite them to the table and hear their voice? Because there's some pretty amazing voices out there. And in the past, there have been some pretty amazing people who kind of claw their way through despite everything. But there's a lot more. There are a lot more in this country and on the planet, too. And um, I mean, even just in the United States, we lose about 600,000 kids a year that do not make it to the diploma. They don't make it. Why is that not a crisis? Why can we not use our creativity to say, do you know what? It's not good enough. We cannot lose a single one. How are we going to do it? Creativity. Thinking outside of the box. Um, by the way, do we have any people who doodled their way through school? Who, who did not pay attention in school? You can admit we're among friends. So we have some back here. Okay. Right? Okay. I was that kid too. I was a... I, I had a lot going on. And I actually, to tell you the truth, I was actually paying attention in school. But for me, it was like a, depending on the teacher, it was like a really good um, uh, uh, segment on NPR, right? If the teacher was really good, I could listen, but I'd be busy doing what I like to do. I like to draw, and I like to think. And so I was kind of working away, and I would listen. Who here, do, can you do two things at the same time, right? Who can actually listen to the radio and do something else? Right? Drive, maybe? Right? Okay. It's pretty handy. Um, but kids are, kids are pretty good at that. In fact, they can, they can juggle multiple things. So I would juggle these multiple things. And I was a mad doodler in most of my classes. And most of my teachers did not appreciate it. They would say, Peter, not in my class. You could do that after school. All eyes up front. And... Uh, so I would put my pencil to one side. Well, later on I developed a strategy. I would look at teachers and I figured out something. Teachers want to be loved. Even if it's one kid in class, they're searching. They're like, does anyone find this interesting? Anyone? Anyone? And if they see a head nod, they're like, oh good, someone nodded their head. That's interesting. And um, so I figured if I, I could draw and doodle, and I would actually, instead of ignoring the teacher, I would just like lock eyes, and I would go, hmm. And that would buy me like 10 more minutes of drawing time. <laughs> Mr. Manson in seventh grade was, I think he was smarter than me by far, and he, he noticed that I was doodling, and he said, Peter, I want to see you after class. So I thought my goose was cooked, and he said, um, uh, and the kids laughed. They, they figured I was in trouble too. All the kids leave. It's just me and Mr. Manson. Mr. Manson said, Peter, I would love it if you would pay attention to me in, in class. And if you do that for me, I'll give you an extra credit project. Look through the McGraw-Hill mathematics textbook. Anybody here from McGraw-Hill? <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> Look through the McGraw-Hill mathematics textbook and see, is there a math concept that you could teach? to another student. So I had to like t t do a double take here. Like, what? Wait a sec, I'm not in trouble. Did he just say um, art and story and math in the same sentence? And he said, so I, I, I'm like, this is cool, I'm not in trouble. So I went home and I, went, I chose a math concept and I created a comic book. Uh, anybody here a, big, a fan of comic books? I used to read, I used to read a lot of comic books. So I created a comic book, and I brought it into Mr. Matson, and he took a look at it, and he said, Peter, do you know what you've done? And I thought, I made a comic book. And he said, well, it's called a comic book, but it's also called a storyboard, and it's that, that is what a filmmaker uses to plan out a film. How would you like to make an animated film of your story to teach math? So at that point, I think I burst into flame. I'm like, this is so cool. This is happening in math class. And I said, yes. And he said, I don't, 
know how to make one. <laughs> that was a cool lesson for me because it was a teacher who admitted they didn't know something. It's a cool paradigm shift. My teacher also asked me to teach. That was a, another wild thing. Nobody, no teacher had asked me to teach. I was a student, they were the teacher. But he asked me to become a teacher. And then because he didn't know how to make an anim animated film, he became a learner. So it was kind of cool because we were learner, teacher, teacher, learner. And Mr. Matson found a really cool film teacher from the high school and who looked like Albert Einstein, a young Albert Einstein. And the, the three of us made an animated film together, collaborating. And uh, so at age 12, I made my very first animated film to teach. And uh, that was thanks to a great teacher who thought off script. And we've gone kind of on script for the past 10 years, been very test centric. A lot of teachers out there hurting and a lot of kids hurting too. A lot of kids who are not being heard. And we've got so on script, and when you stay on script, you can test them. But we're missing out, missing out on a lot of potential. Mr. Matson did something for me that I think is the greatest thing that a caregiver, a teacher, a parent can do. He noticed me. He noticed me, and he got creative. And he thought, do you know what? You haven't hung out with me long enough. I'm gonna get you there. And whether it's reading, if a child says I can't read, you haven't hung out with me long enough, right? I can't write, you haven't hung out with me long enough. And each child is completely different. And it's kind of interesting, because I'm a twin. And when Paul said, look in the mirror, I thought he was gonna ask you to see what it feels like to be a twin. <laughs> but even twins are different. Every single one of us is different. And we all have different voices. We have different ways of being reached. And the cool thing about technology is it can actually listen, adapt, challenge. The tools are amazing. I mean, the palette of tools that are available um, are just beginning to respond to all to the infinite spectrum of possibilities that kids have. We haven't seen them yet. Ten years from now, we're going to be dazzled. I mean, it really is, I think Tom was saying that it, it is, it really is the most exciting decade. A really exciting decade. And I think where I'm going to land is uh, saying thank you to all of you for all you do. I know that each and every one of you in this room has been doing it, probably doing it for a long time. I've been doing it for 30 years. And my, by the way, my media teacher, the film teacher connected me to, uh, when I finished college, I stayed in touch with this guy. He was a mentor of mine and he said, uh, he tracked me down he said, hey, there's this teacher in Cambridge and he's doing this pretty wild stuff using uh, something called the personal computer. He's a teacher at Shady Hill School in Cambridge and he's, uh, He's using a TRS-80 TRS that he bought with his own money, teacher money, at Radio Shack. And he's doing this really cool stuff in, in his classroom. And from, so I, I met this guy, and he looked like John Lennon, long hair, round glasses, and he described his classroom. It was noisy. It was messy. The kids were talking to each other. They were creating maps and drawing. They didn't know where they were going. They were figuring out as they went along, and I'm like, wow, that's my kind of classroom and my kind of teacher. And that teacher was Tom Snyder of Tom Snyder Productions, and, uh, which is now part of Scholastic. And uh, Rick Abrams is here tonight. Rick, if you want to wave. Um, Rick was my mentor for my 12 years at Tom Snyder Productions, and, uh, which is half of my journey here at uh, uh, in educational technology, so thank you, Rick, for inspiring me. <laughs> they told me that this is a mid-life, is it called, what, no, mid-career, not a mid-life crisis, a mid-career award, which is interesting, because I'm doing my calculations, 
So that means I still have a lot of work left. So I have another 30 years. So um, I'm going to be retiring at 83, technically. But because we love what we do and we do what we love, we're going to go until we take our very last breath. So here's to the future. It's exciting. And we're going to do it together. Thank you. Thank you.